Welcome to Leuven and welcome to this uh, educational program on angiogenesis inhibition and understanding the role of angiogenesis inhibition in uh, colorectal cancer. I'm Eric van Kutzum, I'm professor at the University of Leuven uh, here in Belgium. Um, and what I will do in my uh, short presentation is take you through some of the important aspects of understanding the mechanism of action of the anti-androgenic agents that we're using uh, in colorectal cancer, and then highlight also some of the key aspects of uh, some of the clinical trials in first-line and second-line treatment uh, using and studying the angiogenesis inhibitors. Indeed, what is in angiogenesis is important, and over the past uh, 20 years, we have, an, we have learned a lot. We have learned that the angiogenic switch um, is important in tumor growth um, and that while tumors are growing, that we see that blood vessels are growing with the tumor and are becoming chaotic and that the process of angiogenesis uh, becomes an important role. So it was obvious and logic also to study the role of angiogenesis inhibition um, in, in cancer and especially also in colorectal cancer. We have two important aspects in the mechanism of blood vessel formation. That's vasculogenesis, that's the de novo process um, from angioblasts to form primary capillary plexus. And then also angiogenesis, which is the generation of new vessels from existing uh, vessels. And that occurs during fetal development, but that occurs also in adults um, in different processes and occurs also um, while tumor growth is ongoing. And if you look indeed in the process of angiogenesis, uh, there are different aspects in the mechanism that are important. That's the secretion of angiogenic factors, that's new capillary sprouting, and that's sprout fusion and lumen uh, formation. And indeed, if you look back to some of the early studies of one of the pioneers, Judai Falkman, he showed that to grow beyond minimal size, uh, tumors must induce uh, the growth of new blood vessels. And that was when he postulated that hypothesis, that was a real revolution uh, at, these, uh, at these days. And also it was shown that avascular uh, tumors, they grow relatively slowly due to the limited supply of oxygen and nutrients. And also that tumor growth creates a hypoxic condition that induces production of proangiogenic factors such as VGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. And we've learned also that the excessive production of VGF uh, leads to capillary hypersprouting and abnormal chaotic vasculature. And indeed, if you look in images on the formation of uh, vas tumor vasculature, it is uh, shown that endothelial sprouting leads to formation of tumor vasculature and also that the mobilization of endothelial progenitor cells occurs from the bone marrow. And these are some important aspects, leading also to the angiogenic switch in cancer, which is important. And in the angiogenic switch in cancer, uh, that's the point at which angiogenic activators overcome inhibitors and initiate the formation of new blood vessels. And one of the key triggers in this angiogenic switch is tissue hypoxia. And indeed, if you look at the hypoxia, uh, that's low local oxygen uh, concentration, tumor hypoxia is the primary stimulus for VGF production. And on the other hand, we have learned that excessive VGF initiate the tumor angiogenic process. So there are some important aspects that we can try then to interfere. And indeed, if you look at some of the differentiators between physiologic, normal, and tumor pathologic angiogenesis, uh, we see that in tumor angiogenesis, there is a loss of organization of the tumor vasculature. There is abnormal parasite support. There is discontinuous and or abnormal basement membranes. There is an increased vascular permeability and there is an increased interstitial fluid pressure. 
And indeed, all these different processes, complex processes, they contribute to the process of tumor angiogenesis and may stimulate tumor growth. And indeed, that's stimulated on this slide, the, uh, uh, that's illustrated on this slide with different factors uh, such as the tumor cell, the endothelial cell, the stromal cell, the macrophage, the bone uh, marrow derived progenitor, and the dendritic cells. And all these cells uh, interact with the, within the biology of VGFR and interact with uh, VGFA, VGFB and other uh, factors such as PLGF, which is placenta growth factor. Not everything is understood, but we have learned a lot. And this opens opportunities also uh, for interfering and targeting um, uh, with, uh, with these processes with anti-angiogenic agents. Some other aspects that are important is the fact that VGF overexpression is associated with poor prognosis in cancer patients. We can cite examples of different studies in colorectal cancer, gastric cancer, and the list is very long of the different studies where this VGF overexpression is associated with poor prognosis in cancer patients. There are different VGFs, and we, there is in fact a VGF family of ligands and receptors that play a role in tumor angiogenesis, but also in lymphangiogenesis. However, we don't understand what is the real role of inhibition of lymphangiogenesis, but we have learned that different uh, factors in the VGF family, such as VGF A and B, and possibly also C and D, may be targets to interfere with. Uh, although the most frequent target that is inhibited is VGF A um, in this situation. And then there is still some discussion on the role of inhibition of PLGF placenta growth factor. We know that preclinically placenta growth factor contributes to tumor growth, but it's not completely understood what is the role of inhibition of PLGF in, uh, in, in stopping uh, cancers from growing. And indeed, if you look at the different strategies of blocking the VGF receptor pathways, uh, we can do that with, by inhibition of the VGF ligand with drugs such as bevacizumab or aflibercept, which is a fusion protein, which is not an antibody, uh, but which is a fusion protein, but they all inhibit the VGF ligand. Um, we can do that also with antibodies um, to the VGFR2 receptor directly. Ramusirumab is another example. And then we have the tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, that inhibit uh, the different receptors, uh, such as VGFR2. Uh, and some of the examples that we use in colorectal cancer um, is regorafenib, another drug that is being studied in colorectal cancer, is ninentanib, uh, and other studies, other drugs have been studied in the past, uh, maybe not in the right uh, setting. Angiogenesis mechanism of inhibition is one. Second important aspect is the mechanism of resistance, and that's even more complex. Um, we don't understand completely all the different mechanisms of resistance, but there are more and more studies that look at, uh, at the real mechanism of in, uh, resistance. And we know that different factors may contribute to that. Some interesting findings and some interesting studies have shown, for instance, that while patients are on bevacizumab, uh, that just before they become resistant, that we see an increase and a rise of uh, different cytokines, uh, such as PLGF, um, uh, FGF, fibroblast growth factor, PDGF, uh, platelet-derived growth factor. We see an increase in these cytokines before the tumors are resistant, uh, uh, start growing. Um, so we think that they play a, a role in the mechanism of resistance to angiogenesis inhibitors. Coming back to the different uh, drugs that we use um, uh, in colorectal cancer, in fact, we have four different angiogenesis inhibitors, positive data. Three are approved today. Um, that's uh, bevacizumab, which is the antibody that binds to the circulating VGFA. And we have aflibercept, which has a broader mechanism of action. It's a fusion protein. It's also called uh, VGF trap. Um, um, it, uh, it inhibits VGFA, VGFB, and PLGF. Um, 
the VFRAM we serum up, which is not yet approved, but uh, with positive data, uh, which is the antibody that binds to the VGFR2 receptor. And then we have the small molecules, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as regorafenib, which uh, uh, may inhibit different receptors, such as VGFR1, 2, 3, on top of other uh, growth factors. Looking at some clinical data and summarizing the data in first line um, on one slide, uh, um, we have different data, phase 3 trials, uh, first line um, with bevacizumab, a chemo backbone plus or minus bevacizumab, and the chemo backbone may be oxaliplatin uh, based, may be iron based, may be a fluoroprimidine, or maybe even a, a triplet. Uh, in these different settings, uh, 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 with chemotherapy, an active chemotherapy backbone plus bevacizumab, we see a longer survival, uh, longer progression-free survival in all studies, and a longer survival in some of the studies uh, of the chemo backbone plus uh, bevacizumab versus the chemo uh, uh, alone. The challenge is in second line. How do, do we choose in second line? The choice, of course, depends uh, what we do in first line. Um, we may go for a doublet of chemo cytotoxic alone. We may use a doublet plus a continuation of bevacizumab. We may use a doublet folfiri plus aflibercept, folfiri plus ramucirumab, or a doublet plus an EGFR antibody, or even a new combination. And that's an important topic uh, to introduce and to, to discuss briefly. So. This slide shows uh, the six randomized studies, uh, that phase three studies that we do have in second line. Four important pivotal studies with angiogenesis inhibitors. And the design of the studies was chemo plus or minus an angiogenesis inhibitor. The ECOG3200 study was chemo plus or minus bevacizumab in bevacizumab naive patients. The TML study was uh, chemo plus or minus bevacizumab in patients pre-treated with bevacizumab. The Vlor study was uh, Falfiri plus or minus aflibercept. One third of the patients were pre-treated with bevacizumab, two thirds of the patients were bevacizumab naive. And then the recently presented Ray study was Falfiri plus or minus ramucirumab, all in bevacizumab pre-treated uh, patients. All four studies show that adding the angiogenesis inhibitor shows a longer survival and a longer progression-free survival. One of the four studies, being the Velour study with aflibercept, showed on top of uh, prolonging survival and progression-free survival that also the response rate went up with adding uh, aflibercept compared to no aflibercept, which was not the case in the two other studies. And then in second line, to complete the field, we have two randomized phase 3 studies with the anti-EGFR antibodies, uh, one with cetuximab, the EPIC study, one with panitumab, the 181 study. Both studies showed a prolonged progression-free survival, but no prolonged uh, survival in this uh, situation. We don't have head-to-head -head studies of the different agents uh, in one study, so we have only cross-trial comparisons. The TML study was a study in patients pre all pre-treated in first line with bevacizumab, and then in second line there was a continuation of bevacizumab or no bevacizumab. Uh, there was an improved survival, there was an improved progression-free survival with continuation of bevacizumab after progression. The Vlor study is an important study. Uh, it highlights the activity of aflibercept. It's a second line phase three study a pure study, Falfiri plus or minus placebo-controlled uh, uh, aflibercept. One-third of patients were bevacizumab pre-treated, two-thirds bevacizumab naive. In both subgroups of patients, there was a benefit of adding aflibercept, uh, so as well in the bevacizumab pre-treated as in the bevacizumab naive patients. Uh, and then the last study was the RACE study, Falfiri plus or minus ramucirumab, also the primary endpoint in the study was survival. There was a survival benefit as well as a progression-free survival. There was no response rate uh, difference in this study. So that brings us for the clinicians the challenge, how should we, what should we do in second line? It's obvious that in second line we change the cytotoxic backbone. 
But we don't have head to head studies um, uh, looking at. Um, at which of the antibodies, which of the angiogenesis inhibitors is the most active in second line. So we take our decision and base our decision on different considerations. For instance, uh, there is a rel the relative benefit of the antiguvar antibodies, uh, cetuximab and panitumab, is identical in third line than it is in second line. There are some toxicity considerations, uh, bevacizumab versus aflibercept. In the trials, cross-trial comparisons, aflibercept is a bit more toxic than bevacizumab, but this may also be due to some aspects of the design. Uh, and the GVAR antibodies are more toxic um, than, than uh, in second line than, for instance, bevacizumab. Uh, on the other hand, we know that uh, aflibercept leads to a high response rate um, in second line, um, compared in cross-trial comparisons to ramucirumab, which is not influence the response rate, and map, which did not uh, influence the response rate neither. This response rate may be important in some patients who are very symptomatic, or in those patients who are still borderline resectable. And on the other end, the last point is also the design of the trials. Uh, the patients in the map post-progression continuation trial were patients who did quite well on the initial treatment in first line with map, while uh, patients with aflibercept uh, uh, may be uh, uh, rather also patients with fast progression on the first line. If we see, for instance, a fast progression of all fox map, then we want to change everything. Um, um, and the challenge is, of course, what is a fast progression? Is this two months? Is this four months? Uh, there, there is no clear answer. But there are some important considerations for the clinicians with the lack of clinical randomized trials head to head of these different agents that may help us to distinguish and to make our choice. So we have learned a lot um, um, in the field of angiogenesis and colorectal cancer, but there's still a long way to go, still a lot to learn. Uh, and just some of the questions for the future, to look at the future also, that are important. Uh, we may combine angiogenesis inhibitors in the future with checkpoint inhibitors, with other targeted agents, for instance. We don't understand why TKIs failed in combination with chemotherapy in early lines. They clearly induce, uh, increase the toxicity of the cytotoxic backbone. The question is whether there are other uh, reasons also why the TKIs failed in early lines. A single agent, they seem to be active, at least in the regorafenib trial, in later lines. Unfortunately, we don't have predictive markers. Um, we don't understand all aspects on the mechanism of resistance. Uh, we, have, we need strategic trials to determine what is the best strategy, comparative trials. Um, we have learned some aspects on post-progression continuation, um, but there is still more to learn on maintenance treatment on, in, this, in view of this strategy. And then a final question also is, uh, of course, in the adjuvant setting, um, bevacizumab uh, was not active, as was the case with the anti juvar antibodies, while it was active in metastatic disease. We don't understand uh, um, why this is. So there is still a lot of there are still a lot of topics for further research uh, with this. But I'm happy to tell you that we have learned a lot and that we can uh, look at that in the debate f uh, that will follow this session um, on the view point of view of uh, of my colleagues and myself how we can integrate some of these learnings uh, and these important learnings. Uh, Thank you very much.